appreciated that with Ed's. Um, I don't ever disagree with somebody like Admiral Katz. The only thing I will point out is that I'm old enough, I was in the Navy before there were swoves. <laughs> uh, and I don't know what I'm talking about. It, aviators had their wings, submariners had their dolphins, and we had black shoes. <laughs> they were proud of it. In fact, uh, and then I'll quit telling sea stories, but my last job on Little Rock was, uh, or one of my collateral duties was, I was put in charge of the closed circuit television station there. And our theme song was Mothers of Invention, Brown Shoes Don't Make It. <laughs> Which really endeared me to the helo debt <laughs> of Little Rock. So I want to I want to thank y'all. Thank y'all for having me. It's glad, glad to be back with my fellow surface warriors. I want to thank Doug Katz, Mayor McCullough, the members of this association. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for making sure that we stay apprised of the issues that are facing our surface fleet. And we've got to have strong support from organizations like you we're going to continue to develop the creative solutions that we've got to have as we face uh, an ever-changing, ever more complex world. We face, as you know, a national, international security environment that's full of complexities and uncertainties, social disorder, political change, advancing technology around the world continue to drive our foreign policy and global engagement. Now, our Navy and our Marine Corps are America's first line of defense, deployed worldwide. We're America's away team. Uniquely, what we provide, the Navy and Marine Corps, is presence, that constant presence, ready for any challenge that may come over the horizon. Now, I talk about presence a lot, but what does it really mean? First, it means that we deploy pretty much the same in times of war and in times of peace. In order to provide that presence that we need today, we have more than 100 ships forward deployed and more than 30,000 Marines deployed around the world. And they're doing this myriad of missions from airstrikes against ISIL, to fighting Ebola, to exercising with our partners and our friends to protect freedom of navigation in the Pacific. And as we've drawn down from two land wars, our sister services talk about reset and coming home. Well, there are no permanent homecomings for sailors and Marines for 239 years. We've deployed continually to keep America's adversaries far from our own shores. We deploy not only to fight and win our nation's wars, but also to act as a powerful deterrent to potential adversaries. Second, presence means we're where it matters when it matters. Because we're forward deployed, we're usually there when a crisis begins to develop. Coming from the sea, we can get any place quicker. We can stay as long as we need to. We bring everything we need, and we don't have to ask anybody's permission to operate. Those are pretty significant attributes when you think about some of the distances involved and some of the time needed to react. Being there, providing that presence, gives our nation's leaders an array of options. And those options range from the humanitarian assistance calls that we get on a very regular basis, including things like Japan, the Philippines, Haiti, to delivering first strikes against ISIL off the deck of the USS George H.W. Bush. And that last one is a great example. When the president decided that 
we would strike ISIL. The Bush was in the Northern Arabian Sea doing combat air over Afghanistan. Within 30 hours, she was in the Northern Arabian Gulf on station, ready to launch strikes. She was our only option for 54 days. 54 days. And it wasn't because we didn't have other assets in the region, it was because we couldn't get permission to take off armed to do those strikes. We didn't have to ask anybody whether we could take off from the bush. I think that's one example of just how vital the Navy Marine Corps are to our national security. And it goes back through history, from the victories over the British frigates 200 years ago, through Manila Bay, Battle of the Atlantic, World War I, the vast reaches of the Pacific, World War II. But it isn't only our physical security, as important as that is, that we defend. It's also our economic well-being. The Navy and Marine Corps contribute to our security in a way that's felt by every single American. And the shelves of stores across this country, there's just in time deliveries. And so what we do has a direct impact on the availability of goods and on the prices. I can make a pretty good argument and do a lot that the United States Navy has been the primary reason for the success of the international economic system by protecting the sea lanes and keeping those sea lanes open for everybody involved in peaceful commerce. And the other thing I'm talking about is jobs. In the United States, over 40 million people have jobs directly tied to international seaborne trade. More than one in four working Americans. That's because we live in such an age of globalization and world trade. 90% of all commerce goes by sea. 95% of all our telecommunications and data go under the sea. Our commercial, our economic success is tied to the sea in so many ways and to the rest of the world. And it's not just people who work on ports or on, in ports or on ships. From farming to fashion, from electronics to energy, manufacturing of all kinds are dependent on the imports and the exports over the world's oceans. So our, the security that we provide is tied directly to main streets all across this country. And leading economists at great universities have told us about the link between, and have proved the link between the far presence of the Navy and the Marine Corps and the stability of this globalized economy. And while we benefit economically, we also benefit from the way that some of this shared economic success helps limit conflict and potential wars. When you look around the world where you see unrest and violence, a lot of times you also find high unemployment, stagnant economies, financial struggles. By helping to secure the world's oceans, protect free trade, respond to crisis early, prevent escalation, U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, are vital to the American people, to our security. Providing that presence falls on the surface fleet. The foundation of our Navy. And this is sort of a truism, which I have to explain from time to time. The foundation of our Navy is ships. 
That's what we are. That's why we're the Navy. We have to have the right size fleet to do what we need to do. Now, I've lost track of the number of times that people have come up to me and explained to me how our fleet is shrinking. And so, y'all have heard these numbers before, but I'm going to do it again until nobody comes up and says, fleet's shrinking. On September 11th, 2001, the U.S. Navy had 316 ships. By 2008, after one of the great military buildups in our nation's history, our fleet was down to 278 ships. In the five years before I came into this office, the U.S. Navy put 27 ships under contract. That was not enough to halt the decline in the size of the fleet, and it's also not enough to protect our industrial base. In the first five years I've been in office, we have built, we have put under contract 70 ships with a smaller top line for Navy. In 2014, we launched nine ships. And by the end of the decade, our fleet's going to be back over 300 ships. And so when you say that, the next criticism you get is, well, yeah, that's great, but you've done it at the cost of aviation. Wrong. In five, in the five years, first five years I've been secretary, we have bought 1,300 naval aircraft. That's 40% more than we bought the five years before. We're not neglecting ships or planes. And even as we deal with possible impacts of sequester, <clears throat> now's not the time to give up on the progress that we've made in our shipbuilding. I don't believe you ought to pay for one Navy ship with another Navy ship. Shipbuilding takes a long time. It's long lead times. It takes a long time to get a ship from drawings to commission. It's the least reversible thing we do. If you miss a year, if you cancel a ship, you can't get it back because our industrial base can't handle twice what we had if we miss a year and we try to push it in to the next year. And we have to have those gray hulls on the horizon. So we're building a balanced fleet. First example that is a bad example for this audience, but two Virginia class attack submarines. I mean, I know what submariners call us targets. But we've got to command the undersea as well as the surface. We're building two DDGs a year. We commissioned a big deck amphib in October. Another one is under construction. And Congress in the 2015 budget has put in money for an additional LPD. We're building other support ships like mobile landing platforms and afford foreign staging bases. All of these programs are on schedule and either on or under budget. We also have two carriers under construction, CVN-78 and CVN-79. Now, you've heard as I have about the cost of this carrier program. And it's pretty clear that CVN 78, the Ford, is a prime example of how not to build a ship. We started designing it while we were building it. Too much technology that was not mature, not proven, was tried to be pushed into this first ship. 
and and it's a cost plus contract. But since since I've come into this office, we've started some very strict oversight, and we're driving down the cost of CBN 78 and perhaps more importantly, CBN 79, taking the lessons learned from 78 and applying them to 79 and Kennedy. And at this point, and I believe going forward too, I believe that very strongly, both ships are under and will remain under the congressional cost caps. But we've made some real progress there. And finally, I want to talk to you about our small service combatants. Today in the shipyard in Marinette, Wisconsin, we've got five Freedom class ships currently under construction, including, Admiral, the next USS Little Rock. <coughs> it's an amazing thing to be able to name Navy ships. <laughs> And in Mobile, alongside the high-speed vessels that are in serial production, we have five independence class ships under construction. Four in the fleet, and in 2015, the yards are going to deliver four more. Now, there have also been a lot of stories about LCS. And usually the facts are at least a couple of years, and usually more than that. The facts cited are usually three or four years behind the reality. It's, they're just based on bad data. Because we're in serial production on both classes of ship, the costs keep coming down, and we're launching on schedule. And when this program started, it did have some problems. They've been turned around. And this program, in a lot of ways, is an acquisition success story and a model program. And they're coming in well under, well under the congressional cost cap. These ships are going to be critical to our fleet moving forward. We have a demonstrated need for 52 of them. Last week, we saw the final deployment of the USS Kaufman, our last Perry class frigate. For decades, Perry class has done an outstanding job, been a central part of our work with our partners in theater security missions, providing lower cost, small footprint approaches to operations. Now, these roles are gonna be filled by the Freedom and Independence class of ships. And like every ship we're introducing, these new ships are far more capable than the ones they're replacing. They're operating unmanned systems. They've got a wealth of new and innovative technology, and they're going to be forward deployed a whole lot more. Ms. Kaufman leaves on her last voyage, USS Fort Worth, is in Singapore on her first voyage. She's testing the lessons that we learned from Freedom's deployment to Singapore in the last two years. The upgrade we've made to both the hardware and the operating concepts that we based on those lessons. Looking at Freedom's experience, we've made 400 individual changes to Fort Worth before she deployed. Now, this class of ship, and both were variants of them, are equally at home in blue water and brown. Fort Worth is tailor-made for the broad expanses of the Pacific, which she crossed to get to Singapore, using far less fuel than had been anticipated, but flexible and agile enough to work in the littorals and coastal waters of Southeast Asia. She's going to be in Singapore for 16 months, and we're going to rotate three crews in. Ship stays where it is. The 
crews come and join the ship. And immediately, immediately after arriving in Singapore, she went back to sea and was taken apart in the search operations for the Air Asia flight. These ships aren't a test case anymore. They're a normal part of our fleet. And based on the results of the Small Surface Combatant Task Force, we're improving both variants making them more lethal, making them more survivable, ensuring that they are multi-mission. And in, by improving these, we're also doing the constant incremental improvements that we do on every ship class. And even with the additional expense of putting in this increased lethality, increased survivability. These ships are still going to come in under the cost cap that was set for them before they had this, these improvements. Some of the things we put in is a new over-the-horizon missile, surface-to-surface -surface missile, upgrade and improve combat systems, a dedicated towed array, sonar, and we're hardening certain parts of the ship to make it more survivable. And because of the efficiency of the yards and the way we've been able to reduce cost, this ship is still going to be the most affordable in our arsenal. Now I've talked and Admiral Cass talked about my ship, the Little Rock, we had a thousand people on that ship. She was an old ship. She was built during World War II. And after the war, she was laid up, put in mothballs. As the Cold War heated up in the 50s, she was pulled out, put, put through a refit that lasted three years. Weapons taken out, new ones put on. New sensors added, the entire back of the ship, the stern, I guess, or the superstructure was taken out and replaced in, a, in about as ugly a configuration as you can imagine. <laughs> but the biggest challenge was the addition of the then revolutionary new weapon, the Talos guided missile. And Little Rock went through that one big conversion with several small ones, and served until the past the middle of the 70s. And the history of that ship is one of the hallmarks of the constant drive of the naval profession, the service community for improvement, adaptation. The Navy tore that ship apart, inside out, rebuilt it to make it a viable platform for a new age. And we've done that over and over again, from the introduction of the Monitor, the first steam-powered armored ships during the Civil War, to the gunnery revolution led by some junior officers during the last century, to the Marine Corps development of amphibious warfare between the two world wars, our sailors, our Marines, have always looked to be on the cutting edge. And I think we need to embrace a couple of things. One is the tradition of the Navy, a long tradition. And it's a tradition of innovation, developing new ideas. When Little Rock was put into the shipyard and rebuilt as a new kind of cruiser, she was redesignated. She started out as a CL, light cruiser because that's what the nation needed at the end of World War II. Once she was refitted, recommissioned, she was changed to CLG, light guided missile cruiser. And it ch this change connected that new and innovative weapon system with the long naval history and tradition. And we've a little bit gotten away from that today. We started naming ships or designating ships 
with some interesting acronyms that seem to have come out of the Pentagon instead of our naval traditions. And I'm thinking about things like AFSB, MLP, JHSB, and of course, LCS. It's not an L-class ship. I hear L, I think Amphi. Everybody else does. I hear Littoral, and I have to tell you, I spend a good bit of my time explaining what a Littoral is. <laughs> so I think it's time that we reconnect our tradition of innovation and creative thinking with what we're doing today. And I've talked with the CNO, Assistant Secretary for Acquisition, Sean Stackler. We got input from this community. And so we're gonna start with the LCS. One of the requirements that the Small Service Patent Task Force had was to have a ship with frigate-like capabilities. It's a frigate, we're gonna call it. We're going to change the whole designation from LCS to FF for, for LCS. It's going to be the same ship, same program of record, just with a, an appropriate and a traditional name. And in coming weeks, we're going to announce new hull designations for the other types of ships that I have mentioned. As a former CNO, George Anderson once said, the Navy has both a tradition and a future. And we look with pride and confidence in both directions. For 239 years, our Navy and Marine Corps have been agile, innovative, and adaptive. Forward deployed, they remain the most responsive option to defend the United States. We have to make sure even through these uncertain times, that it remains so. So from the Navy, Semper Fortis, Forever Courageous, from the Marines, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Thank you. This is a shy group, but <laughs> I've got one, sir. How are we gonna pay for <laughs> Well, <clears throat> number one, we're driving down the cost of everything. Um, my father, born in 1901, tree grower on the hardware store in Akron, Mississippi. Also was one of the cheapest people. God has ever seen fit to put on this <laughs> Back when I was running for state auditor in Mississippi, I met a guy in Wiggins, Mississippi, who came up to me and said, are you Raymond Mavis' son? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, I'm going to vote for you. If you're half as cheap with the state's money as your daddy is with his, we'll be OK. <laughs> well, let me just say, I am his son. <laughs> so that's, that's one way. A second way is don't fall into the trap of paying for one Navy ship with another Navy ship. Um, you know, the fact that big platforms are easy targets for budget cutters. Well, just take a ship, take a carrier, take a, take a destroyer, that'll save you X amount of money. Look at harder things. We're saving at least $4 billion a year on service contracts today. And it's because now we can track the dollar from when Congress appropriates it to when we get a contract. A couple of years ago, we couldn't do that. It's, it's hard. And it's not <coughs> big and you can't say, well, we're taking that. But there's real money there. And 
again, it's about setting some priorities and sticking with it. And I'm gonna protect Shipville for as long as I possibly can. Andrew. Good morning, Secretary Mavis Andrea Ashalal with Reuters. Um, I wanted to ask you, there were reports out this week that the Navy's now decided with the Marines to go ahead and opt for the V-22 the, to do, take care of the carrier onboard delivery. Um, can you walk us through that decision and, 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 and explain what you'll get from the V-22, whether there's additional capabilities? And then I wanted to ask you real quickly, um, um, I know that you know, the budget is pre-decisional, but we do know that sequestration is due to take effect again in fiscal 16, and we've heard that the Pentagon is going to submit a budget that is over the sequestration limits. Can you just talk about what you think is going to happen with sequestration <laughs> and whether you think you'll get it lifted? Thank you. Andrew, I would have been so disappointed if you hadn't. Um, <laughs> Asked me to talk about some things I cannot talk about until the budget drops. <laughs> and, and I can't about either one of those. And I know that the, the memorandum has become public uh, before the budget, but I'm, I'm simply going to have to wait until the budget drops. On the B-22, the one thing I will, will say about, about the possible use of the B-22 is <clears throat> That is a great example of the Navy and Marine Corps team working together. It's also a, um, a great example of using a proven, um, a proven manufacturing process, a proven asset um, to, to get lower cost instead of starting over on a, uh, on a new, on a completely new system. So, after, I think it's still February 2nd, after February 2nd, or on February 2nd, I'll be happy to sit down and talk to you about all sorts of details about that. Well, I mean, regardless of what budget is put in finally, the president's got a responsibility to put in a budget that he believes will protect the United States of America. And um, I know he, he takes that very seriously, and so do we. Well, the, I mean, I've described sequestration using a technical term, uh, dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, and it will have some pretty devastating impacts. Uh, what, what my argument has been is that <clears throat> you, you won't necessarily have a smaller fleet because I'm going to protect shipbuilding. But it's going to have bad impact somewhere. Um, our bases are, I mean, we're already at 70% sustainment for our bases. And we're, we're looking at, at that. Um, it's, going to, it's going to have an impact not on the forward deployed forces, but on, and particularly this is a case in the Marines, they're going to have everything they need um, when we deploy, the training, the equipment. But it's the next to go, and it's the people at home and their training cycle and their access to equipment uh, that, um, that are going to be impacted. And so, I mean, you know, part of, I think part of our job is showing some of those, some of those impacts going forward. Uh, if, if sequestration were to hit. But uh, Congress has shown in 14 and 15, we can, we can avoid this. And, um, and again, I think it's our responsibility to put in a budget that we think does the job of meeting the missions that the country expects of us and to defend the country. Who else? Mr. Secretary, good morning. Otto Kreis with Sea Power yeah, Magazine yeah. and a former brown shoe. <laughs> uh, a clarification. I apologize, Otto. <laughs> yeah, we, we like the service of the Navy. They take us where we need to go. Um, 
A clarification, uh, the FF designation will be on the next 20 LCSs and the, the first uh, uh, 50, uh, 32 will be named to be determined? Uh, pretty much. Uh, the only thing I will say about that, it will certainly be on the last 20. We're doing the detailed engineering work and design work right now um, to do the enhanced survivability, enhanced lethality. If we can fold those in earlier uh, than 19, which is when we're, we will finish building 32, if we can fold it in earlier, those ships will be designated FF. And one of the great things about the way the Small Service Combatant Task Force came, came out is we can retrofit either, either version with these upgrades. Um, and as ships get retrofitted, their designation will change. We're looking at what to call the first, uh, the first number of uh, what is today. And would you respond to um, uh, the testing evaluation, with Mr. Gilmore's uh, criticism that the changes you're making to the next 20 really don't improve that survivability that much? Well, I'll say two things. Number one, Mr. Gilmore was, was what we showed him and his folks the Small Service Combatant Task Force and the process we were going through, we included them at every, every step of the way. Uh, and he was there when that decision was, was made. Uh, and number two, there is no way you can make any Navy ship 100% survival. It's just not. And what you have to look at is what's the role of that ship? What survivability does it need to perform that role? And there are different levels of survivability that, that you need. And we are absolutely confident, particularly with the upgrade, but that this ship can do its mission. And one, you know, the CNO keeps pointing out that one of the ways ships are survivable is they don't get hit. And being fast, having a a knockout punch of your own to keep from getting hit you know, is one of the best ways of uh, best ways to survive. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. All right, can you hear me now? I can. All right, sir. First, let me be one of the sailors that says thank you for adding into our tradition Semper Fortis. <laughs> thank you. Um, I didn't realize I was doing it, but somebody told me I was. I, well, uh, I we're, thought we're it was, proud. I thought it was great. there. <laughs> we're proud of it, sir. So thank you. Um, to uh, my question, um, as I leave after 32 years in the Navy, and we see the onset of women in submarines, and you talk about building ships in submarines and where our future is going and traditions and so forth, and blending all of that in, where do you see us right now in that full incorporation of enlisted and officer females on submarines, and when do you think that first one will launch fully integrated with both officer and enlisted? Well, we've, <coughs> great question. Uh, we've got, as you know, women officers now, SSBNs, SSGNs. First women officers are now reporting to Virginia class attack submarines. In the next little while, and I won't nail myself down, but not very long, we're, we'll come out with the, with the detailed plan of uh, integrating enlisted uh, women into our submarine force. And, uh, and it's not going to be I mean, it will take a little while to do it, but um, because we'll have to make a few changes here and there, structural changes in, on the subs, but it won't take won't take that long. And now that you have to ask that question, I want to say one more thing: we don't have enough women in the navy. Yes, sir. We just don't, and uh, and we're working on it. Uh, we're working on trying to trying to increase the numbers because as we do, we have a stronger we have a stronger Thank you, and I'm proud to be your senior enlisted woman in the Navy. Me too. I'm proud of you. Sir. And don't leave. <laughs> 32 years, that's not enough. Extend my higher tenure, sir, and I'm yours. <laughs> <laughs> now you see why she's the senior enlisted woman in the Navy. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Morning, Sec Mr. Secretary. My name is Brian McGrath, and I'd like to talk to you about fleet size. 
um, early in the administration, especially when uh, Bob Work was your undersecretary, um, the total number of ships seemed to be minimized uh, in favor of discussion of networks. Um, it's in favor of discussion of networks and the networking power. As time has gone on, the total size, the number of the fleet seems to have become more important. Can you explain that very, very positive thing? Sure. Um, well, because of what you talked about, the networking, the, the increased capabilities, sometimes dramatically increased capabilities of these ships, the, the ships that are replacing the newer ships are just far more capable. And so we don't need as many. We don't need a 600 fleet Navy to do the jobs that a 600 fleet Navy would have done 30 years ago. Um, but the more we got into it, and the more we looked at it, and the more we saw the demands and the role that the Navy plays, quantity has a quality all its own. And um, our fleet, when we got here, as I said, was, was shrinking. Um, finding out why that was the case, getting some of those programs under control, uh, driving down the costs so that we could afford the ships, um, took us a while. I mean, it took us a year or two to, to get there, uh, to be confident that we could. And I'm absolutely confident now. That, uh, that we're going to go past the 300 ship mark uh, for the end of this decade, and that we will stay um, at above 300 ships long into the long into the future in order to do the all the jobs that uh, that we need to do. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Make a quick please. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Mr. Secretary, I'm Mike Seifert. Um, while it's great that we're increasing ship numbers and ship building is on the rise, on the horizon there's the Ohio replacement uh, program that, that's gonna pressurize all of that. So how do you fit in funding Ohio replacement, funding the new carriers, and then still being able to afford anything else shipbuilding wise? Well, I'll give you two big answers to that. Number one, again, I don't think you pay for one Navy ship with another Navy. Um, and two, the CNO and I have talked about this a lot. We've testified to this. This should not be a Navy bill. Uh, if it is, uh, it will take up about half of what we've traditionally spent on shipbuilding for 12 years. Um, if you do that, the impact will be akin to or greater than sequestered. Uh, because you're either going to impact the rest of the fleet or you're going to impact something somewhere else. Congress is, is, is being um, very responsive. We're beginning this conversation. They've set up a fund uh, for the Ohio class replacement. Now, no money is in the fund yet, but it's a great first step. Um, we start building these in 2021. We're already spending billions of dollars to, to get them up. Uh, to, to do the engineering, the R&D, the design drawings, this sort of stuff. But um, um, either because this is a national program that needs to be paid for with national funds in some way, it's the most survivable leg of the triad. It will be the most survivable leg of the triad as, as far into the future as we can see. And, or, maybe shipbuilding needs to be plussed up to account for it. Um, you, you, you simply cannot gut the Navy for this one, uh, for this one very high problem. Of course, as a quick follow-up to that, I mean, I'm hearing from the Air Force that if, if I know, if, uh, if you were to get the uh, Ohio replacement funded as a, uh, a non-service funded program, the Air Force would step in and say, great idea, we need that for the new strategic bomber and we need that for Minuteman. If the Air Force can make that case, have at it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to me, that's not a good argument. Uh, this is the most survivable 
leg of the tribe. This is one of our very top national priorities. If they can make that case for some of their programs, they should. But they shouldn't say, don't do it for Navy because somebody else may do it. <laughs>